All right, Nadia. Serious bunch. Let's go ahead. Yeah, and... should we get started? For sure. Uh, thank you, everyone, for, for coming today. Um, first, we'll just do a quick introduction. Uh, this session is run by the uh, Education Committee for the ACSA. Um, my name is Adam Fogel. I'm the current Vice President for the American Institute of Architecture Students uh, and the Student Director on the board of, of the ACSA. Yeah, okay. And I'm Nadia Anderson. I am the chair of the Education Committee and um, for this year, for 2019-20. And Danielle is bringing up our one and only slide, um, which is just giving the names of, um, <clears throat> sorry, the names of committee members, uh, and then a little bit of the overview of what we'll be doing tonight. And this uh, discussion is really an evolution of uh, the special focus session that we were supposed to host at the annual meeting in San Diego. And when that session was actually called Imploding Studio, Can We Open the, the Black Box? And was set up to be an experiential session looking at breakout groups looking at different types of pedagogical strategies and then having discussion topics uh, related to those. Um, but alas, this, that did not get to go forward. So um, we really, we realized once we were able to reconvene after having been in, in virtual land for a while, um, that this was an opportunity to really not only uh, to be able to rethink and speculate on what is sort of the future for our discipline and our pedagogy, particularly in terms of our pedagogy, and that the idea that architectural education and practice are really social constructs that, um, you know, can't, that embody certain kinds of values and traditions and so therefore can be changed. And we also very much wanted this to be a conversation involving both students and faculty. So I'm not sure exactly how we split out. I've recognized a couple of students out there. Um, <laughs> it's to uh, be able to start having these kinds of conversations um, because there have, been, there have been other ones on um, each side, uh, but in isolation. So when we first introduce, um, introduce the committee. Again, I'm Nadia Anderson and I'm an associate professor at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte. Um, Adam just introduced himself as the vice president from AIAS and recent graduate from Clemson, I believe. Uh, no, oh gosh, IIT. Okay, <laughs> sorry. I See, I already messed up. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why I thought I was thinking Clemson. Um, anyway, so we're also tonight, we have um, Alexis Gregory with us, who is an associate professor at Mississippi State, um, who's gonna be talking about empathy in a little while. Mark Pearson from the architecture program at the College of DuPage, which is community college in Glen Ellen, Illinois, outside of Chicago. And he's going to be talking about um, some of the barriers and opportunities for community college students, both in terms of studio pedagogy and also some of the challenges since um, the whole COVID-19 pandemic. Um, then we've also got Beth Lundell Garver from the Boston Architectural College um, and Danielle Dent, who is our staff liaison from um, ACSA, where she is the Director of Membership, Marketing and Publications. Um, I'm not sure if Iklas Sabuni, the um, Dean at Prairie View a and is going to be joining us, but she's also on the committee. Um, and then we have two members who unfortunately can't join us, Peter Lawrence, who is at Clemson. <laughs> That's probably where I, I got the, I don't know. And then Amy Larimer, who is the Assistant Director of the Architectural Design Program at um, Stanford University. So this is really the culmination of an academic year's worth of work looking at uh, particularly studio, but also you know, other types of architectural pedagogy. 
Um, and the other part of the slide really is just uh, the structure. So we're going to spend about 30 minutes giving some very brief overviews of some of the topics that we looked at this year and then um, spend you know, the remaining, hopefully at least 45 minutes, if not more, um, for discussion and that sort of thing. And I think what we're going to try to do for discussion is if you have questions, to um, put at use the ch the chat function to type those in, um, and then we'll, we're going to we'll kind of play it by ear in terms of raising hands. I and mean, you don't want it, want us to just be talking all the time. So um, I think what we may do is have a, a question as a prompt, and then we can do some hand raising with some responses um, and move on. So. We'll see how that goes. Yeah, and okay. not, Nadia, can I jump yeah. in real fast? Uh, just a couple of other quick logistical things. If you're not talking, um, we ask that you please oh. mute yourself just to prevent some feedback. Um, and as Nadia mentioned, if, if you're not familiar with Zoom by now, uh, there's a little uh, under the participants, there's a raise hand button. Uh, please use that when we'll be talking uh, or answering questions if you'd like to chime in. Uh, we'll try to call on as many people as possible. Obviously, we do have a small window of time. Um, so we will be giving priority to people who haven't spoken yet. So just keep that in mind. And then we do want to hear from uh, a pretty good balance of students and educators tonight. Um, so thank you both groups for joining us. And uh, yeah, I think that that should do it. So I will toss it back over to Nadia. That's good. Thanks. Adam's a, Adam's a pro at, at these by now. <laughs> All right. Um, so I'm just going to give a really quick overview of um, some of the work of the committee and then also some of the um, kind of literature and background that we started with. Um, so the previous two years of the Education Committee are really provided foundations for this year's work. In 2017-18, uh, the committee focused on, uh, particularly on socioeconomic equity, um, did some both qualitative and quantitative data collection on pipelines, um, admissions, uh, work on student journeys and paths through education. Um, and then last year's committee, the, ne the next step was to really compile a very extensive bibliography of resources, journal articles, conference papers on architectural pedagogy, um, and also did an analysis of ACSA activities over the last 20 years. And we've had, there are also committee members who have been on one or both of those in the past year. Um, this year's charge, and I'm going to read this, uh, is specifically titled Enriching Pedagogy and Enhancing Learning Culture, which sounds relatively neutral. Um, uh, the Education Committee is charged with identifying best practices for teaching and learning in architecture that support a healthy learning culture within architecture schools. This work should address how to promote an inclusive environment that addresses the needs of students with diverse, uh, sorry, diverse democratic, uh, all right, diverse demographics, <laughs> got it, um, such as socioeconomic status, race, ethnicity, gender identity, sexual orientation, learning difference, religion, and so on and who are also enrolled in a range of architectural programs, two-year, four-year, pre-professional, professional, um, all of the above. And this is really tied into some of the strategic plan objectives of ACSA as an organization, including improving gender, racial, and socio socioeconomic equity. Um, also fostering dialogue about education to advance architectural pedagogy, and develop more inclusive uh, programming to engage community colleges and non-professional programs. And following um, discussions that I had with Rashida Ng, the president of, uh, or the outgoing now president of ACSA, and then within the committee, we really wanted to focus on issues related to studio pedagogy, um, particularly since you know the studio has been so central to architectural pedagogy for a very long time. 
and is very much central to the um, cultures of practice as well as education. Um, one note I, on uh, sort of some things about terminology uh, that I've recently learned and I think they're very helpful is that while diversity and inclusion are outcomes and sort of quantitative measurements of things like you know, diversity being how many, you know, students of various categories do we have in a program. Um, equity is really much more about um, the sort of praxis, the, the value informed, um, you know, methods by which we actually achieve diversity and, um, and uh, that kind of thing. So, um, so equity, discussing equity really gets into thinking about the values that underline or underscore um, education uh, as opposed to the outcomes. Um, and there we often get into a lot of focus on quantitative outcomes um, and without thinking, or the question is always, well, why have, for example, the percentage of African-American students in architecture programs, you know, continue to, to be very, very low and have been that way for, you know, decades, even then, yes, there's some movement, but it's really minor in terms of um, the, or, you know, Hispanic students, um, and that there are still these kinds of discrepancies, and that looking at the underlying values that structure what we do is really the next thing, it's what we need to do in order to diversify our approaches and have um, both students and ultimately faculty and practitioners who represent the public, you know, who represent the multiple publics that are out there. Um, so anyway, uh, let's see. So some of the things about studio culture um, in terms of cultural production and you know, the humanist approach to education that often locates architecture as a producer of culture, um, the idea is that to produce equitable culture, and this is um, making a reference to Paulo Freire, that, um, that architectural education needs to consider itself not just as a methodology, but really as a praxis that's defined as action informed by and linked to values and that we really explicitly articulate those values and connect them to the ways in which teaching and learning um, are happening. So, um, and, and part of this is also not to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but to identify the components of studio culture and studio pedagogy, um, such as project-based learning that are very important. Um, so, you know, critiques of studio pedagogy with respect to equity um, include things like the focus on product versus over process, um, the mystery equal mastery, that's, I like that one, um, you know, that we have, that we tend to reward dominant cultural capital. Uh, that gets into the ideas of the hidden curriculum um, and one of the, the resources that I like, the uh, work done by Linda Grote and Sherry Aronson, for example, in the 1990s, conducting surveys of students and faculty, you know, revealed this idea of the hidden curriculum that has not only, um, you know, it's not only about delivery of knowledge, but there's also social dynamics and other kinds of practices that um, support the power structure of dominant culture. And some of the results of their surveys, for example, showed that um, women and people of color tended to often feel marginalized or left out of um, what was considered the mainstream cultural values of pedagogy. So, um, and of course, that it, one of the things I've been thinking is that how it would be interesting to see how much has that changed, you know, in the last, what, 30, almost 30 years. Um, so some of the questions that have come up specifically since we've all gone virtual, um, you know, really technolo technology access 
has made it very clear that there there are problems with inclusiveness in terms of access to culture or access to technology access to you know the learning environment that we normally think of as the space of the studio um, this is certainly true not only for higher education but also for you know educators of all of all sorts um, also the idea of uh, you know I've had any number of conversations with, that are somewhat nostalgic about how much we miss the you know the the space the place the culture of of the studio, the in-person contact, the one-on-one -on -one desk crits. Um, and, you know, I would say I, I'm certainly in there for that too. Um, but I think being aware of the opportunity for um, rethinking equity and inclusion in architectural education by rethinking its learning culture through some of the things that have been revealed in the virtual context is a way to move forward. So, um, you know, th that's kind of a foundation for what we've been talking about. And Adam now is gonna take the reins and talk a little bit more about, specifically about learning culture. Thanks, Nadia. Yeah, so shifting uh, into more of a, I guess, uh, for those of you that just joined us, uh, just please please mute yourself so we don't get any feedback. Um, anyway, yeah, shifting into a learning culture overview. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar, the, the AIAS originally began this campaign, um, I believe it was in the early 2000s. Um, and the idea of studio culture, right, was about mental health and well-being. Um, and now it's grown into a lot more. Uh, now we have seen this evolution during the, the NAB accreditation review forum into a more holistic learning and teaching culture. Because as we know from pedagogy, it's so much more than just studio in architecture, right? There's all of these additional classes. Um, so why, why did we keep calling it studio culture if we wanted to make sure that learning and overall mental health uh, were at the priority. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and share some statistics in the chat really fast. Uh, hopefully this copies correctly. So this is some information that we had originally gathered um, when our session was supposed to be in person at the annual meeting. But anyway, it really just emphasizes the overall university mental health statistics uh, across the nation. Um, and you can see in here that there is a large number of students that feel overwhelmed, uh, have some sort of anxiety or just overall exhaustion, loneliness. Um, let me see, I do have the source as well. For those of you that are interested, you can go ahead and, and look up more of that. Um, but yeah, coming from the American College uh, Health Association, you know, it's, it's kind of overwhelming. Obviously this isn't just architecture students, but we have all gone through an architecture program and we understand that, oh wow, this is, this is definitely a pretty intensive program and curriculum. Um, the thing that we hear a lot from our students though, and from what ACSA has heard from their educators is that people look at these statistics and think, oh, this, this isn't my students. My students are, are part of the 13% that, that don't feel overwhelmed. They're fine. And, you, you have that overwhelming kind of mentality across the board, uh, which just goes to not help the situation anymore. Um, and so what AIS has done has this year specifically, we've spearheaded a new model learning and teaching culture, something that is gonna be integrated with NAB accreditation in order to make sure that we're taking care of our students first and foremost. Obviously their education is important, but if there is some overlying mental health issue, uh, who's to say how much they're actually gaining from their education? Um, and so tonight, I kind of wanted to, to pose the question, um, and you can just do a quick show of hands. Who is, and this is for both educators and, and our students on the call, who is familiar with what their university studio culture policy is? Okay, so a, a good amount of people, that's great. And, and we hope to see uh, soon 100% with that. Um, but the thing that we were really gonna focus on is, 
is how to talk to your students about learning and teaching culture. Um, because a lot of people don't necessarily understand where to start. Mental health is a more accepted uh, com topic of conversation now than it was 10, 20 years ago, um, but it's still not quite where it needs to be. Um, the AIS has actually put together a blog post uh, and kind of guide, if you will, and I can share that in the chat for everyone that's interested, um, just how to talk and how to rewrite your studio culture to update it to the year 2020, especially now as we move into potentially more online or permanent online classes. Um, and so the kind of steps to just break it down uh, starts with research, right? How much does your studio culture policy actually cover? What does it specifically talk about? And then from there, you would break it down into some surveys, put together a few points, questions that you'd like to ask your students and your faculty, um, just how they feel about the studio culture policy, what you would need to improve upon, et cetera, et cetera. And then after you have had those surveys circulated for a while, host a town hall discussion. One thing that we hear a lot from our students is that faculty don't want to talk about this. Um, but from my experience now, this year, sitting on both the AIS board and the ACSA board, it's not necessarily that educators don't want to talk about it. It's just they don't know how. And that's okay, because I know our students don't know how to talk about it either. So we just have to make sure that there are plenty of opportunities to address uh, pedagogy and address mental health in the same environment um, because they overlap so much. And so having some sort of town hall discussion uh, led by your administration or your AIS chapter or any other student leadership in the, in the school is a great way to, to begin that process. And then uh, another thing that we suggest once you have this town hall discussion and you have compiled all your survey results and your notes from the, the meeting, uh, sit down with a dedicated group of people, someone um, that represents the faculty, someone that represents the student voice, and any other administrators in the school and begin to write out and edit the current studio culture policy that you have. Um, and then depending on how the processes at your school work, you want to make sure that it's ratified in some way. Now, sometimes a ratification might not, we're not necessarily right, like a governing body or that sort of thing, but telling your students that this has been ratified or, or asking your students to vote on it and approve of it makes them feel included. Um, and that's something that students definitely want to be involved with because it affects their education so often. A lot of the conversations that I've heard as the AIS vice president um, in many different settings is that we're, we're dealing so much with the future of students, but sometimes we forget to include them and ask them what they think of it. Yeah, they, okay, they, they're learning, and I am well aware of this. I can be very naive, uh, but I, I want to make sure that, that everyone understands that just because we don't have as much information doesn't mean we have we don't have anything to add to the conversation. Um, change can be scary for sure. And so definitely having some sort of ratification process to say, hey, this is how you go about dealing with the studio culture policy. Or if you have some sort of, you know, grievance that you would like to, to give, be sure to include that in the studio culture policy. And then the, the last thing to do is really display it and, and enforce it. Um, oftentimes, you have to put in, uh, everyone on this call that's written a syllabus knows of all of the student or the mandatory policies that you have to include. And with NAV accreditation, having some sort of studio culture policy in there is, is required as well. Um, but to all the students on the call and, and many of the faculty that, that probably know this, students don't always read all of those things. So there needs to be a, a better way to, to talk about this, whether it's at some sort of introductory meeting or like the big grand college gathering um, or whatever it's gonna be in the fall. And then making sure that it's more than just before your NAB accreditation visit, as we've heard some of the horror stories, hey everyone, this is our studio culture policy. If anyone asks, it's always been pinned up on that wall over there. Um, and, and that's the thing that AIS is trying to move away from. Uh, we want to make sure that this is more than just a checkbox. And that's why we've taken this effort to, to go in and provide 
everyone with the resources that they need to talk more about mental health overall in the architectural realm. Um, but there's a, there's a lot that goes into that as well. Uh, and so I'm actually going to pass it over to Alexis now to talk more about empathy and how we can begin to engage more people in this entire process. Thank you, Adam. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. I'm going to talk about empathy. And it's a great segue from what Adam was talking about, because if we go back and think about what Nadia talked about with the charge for our committee for this past year, best practices, a healthy learning culture, an inclusive environment, and really addressing our diverse demographics, we have to be empathetic, not just in the general sense and what Adam was talking about and asking generally about the student body, what their thoughts are and what their concerns are, but we also need to start thinking about our students on an individual basis. And we can all think about the issues and the um, struggles that we personally have had going online, having all of our classes online, struggling with some of us for childcare and teaching our children while we are trying to teach our students, everyone's at home all the time, how you have to share your bandwidth. And so while these are more recent issues, we need to think about those in past studios and in future studios. How do we start to become more empathetic with our students and make sure that they, um, feel they can talk to us about some of these issues. So some of the things I wanted to talk about quickly um, is first, architects generally are not known as being very empathetic when we meet with our clients. And so Architecture Studio is not really uh, thought of as an empathetic place by our students. It's thought of as a very intimidating and intense place. And even our lecture courses can be very intimidating and intense as well. So we need to step back and think about how can we teach our students empathy, not just in how they should interact with clients, but in how we interact with them because we teach by doing as well. And so when we start to think about our diverse student bodies, we need to think beyond just gender, uh, economic status, racial and ethic, ethical, excuse me, ethics. Okay, you understand what I'm saying, racial differences. Um, you know, there's a whole gamut of diversity out there. So we want everyone to start thinking about how can we start to be more empathetic with our students? How do we start to talk to them about issues that are familiar to us, but then also how do we start to get them comfortable talking to us about issues that we may not be familiar with? So some of the things I would like people to think about is, have you ever considered that some of your students have financial limitations that may limit the quality and the quantity of their work? Things like limited funds. So I teach at Mississippi State University. Our student body has a large number of students generally that are on Pell Grants. Many of them struggle to afford not just the materials necessary for an architecture studio or for a structures class, but also the technology, even the hardware and the software. And luckily we're able to get some of the less expensive or the free educational versions of software. But some of these students have hardware that's very old and is not very strong. And unfortunately, when we don't have conversations with our students, we see those students as being slackers. We think they're not getting work done because they just don't care, but it's because they don't have the necessary resources in order to achieve work at the quality and the level of some of their colleagues. And so those are things that we might not be comfortable talking to students about money, but instead maybe having a conversation with them about what's going on? Why are you unable to get these things done? And I think things that have been most successful for me is how can I help you? It's not just about um, talking about design, but it's talking about the impact of school and design on everyone's lives. And so those things are important to think about as educators. But from the student perspective, how can you approach your faculty and start a conversation with them? And I know it's not always easy because faculty can be intimidating, but we do need to meet each other halfway. And so instead of just um, being shy and taking your lumps, so to say, when faculty give you a hard time about something, be honest with them and talk to them about your issues. And so I think if we can start to have empathy in both ways, knowing that students are struggling with things that we as faculty don't understand or may have forgotten because we haven't been students for a long time, 
but then also students need to understand that faculty are under certain pressures as well and just may not be considering at all some of the things that you're struggling with. And so we need to be patient with each other and start to have those conversations. And then once we start to understand what our students' struggles are, I think those can really start to help with the studio culture. And so it is a back and forth between the larger surveys and instruments that Adam has talked about and then the one-on-one -on -one conversations with the students, especially the ones you work with more so that you really can have a healthy conversation with them and find out more of the details that we can use in order to help them and to make architecture education work better for them and hopefully relieve some of the stresses. So from there, I'm gonna pass it on to Mark who's gonna talk about community colleges and how that starts to tie into the rest of the conversation. Thank you, Alexis. Uh, so my role on this committee has been to really represent community college architecture programs and to try to give voice to the challenges that our students are facing. And these are community college architecture students who are trying to navigate the transfer process and then complete their professional degrees at your institutions. Uh, so initially, my work included identifying challenges, barriers, pinch points that community college students face in this process. And originally, I was focusing quite a bit on studio placement when students go to transfer, which can be a primary concern. But this has shifted slightly with the pandemic and the move to remote instruction. Our committee has shifted a little bit in terms of our focus. Um, but in our, in our March session that was canceled, we had developed a series of scenarios. And so as we talk about challenges students are facing, I guess I would encourage you all to think about if you were a student or if you were a community college student trying to navigate the transfer process, how would these various challenges or barriers um, make you feel? What would you do, with, do about that? How would you approach these issues? So um, I'm not gonna go through our scenarios, but we had built scenarios based on a list of common challenges that community college students face. And so I reorganized that list to think about what are the challenges that were amplified by the COVID crisis? And then what are the challenges that I'm not sure about how all of the, this kind of move to remote teaching and how those affect. So the things that we've seen amplified, certainly financial challenges. Um, oftentimes students started a community college for financial reasons. And those have definitely been amplified with the move to um, remote learning. Um, the balancing of work and studio demands, many of our students work and are trying to balance that with studio. And when we went remote, we saw a lot of students that really lost control of that balance. Um, you know, students who had shifts added or were suddenly working all night because um, they had been rescheduled by their employers or their employers had added shifts. A lot of our students are essential workers and so they had these work demands, um, you know, in the 10th week of the semester that they didn't have in the seventh week of the semester. So um, that's certainly um, the case. And I imagine a lot of the challenges we saw, um, you saw too in your studios. I don't think these are unique unique to just community college students. Um, access to technology and Wi-Fi. Um, many of our students don't have their own computers. Uh, we provide that for them at the community college level often. And so when we moved to remote learning, students were trying to find out where they could get a laptop or um, our library was wow. even pulling laptops out Director, and giving them to students. The president of the University of Minnesota said, announced that they're gonna reduce as much as possible their um, uh, there's, there's someone who is muted. Hello? Basically, like. Sorry. So, um, access to technology is really spotty. They are not by, um, these have been, uh, you know, common challenge, I think, for all of us working from home. And certainly, um, the students found that to be the case, too. We had some students that were trying to attend class from their cars on their cell phone because it was the only place they could get quiet at home and actually get a good connection. Um, you know, stability at home issues were certainly, I think, amplified by the move to remote learning and it became clear to us who had more stable home lives than others based on some of the challenges we were hearing from our students. And then, you know, the common thing we've all talked about is just students missing their peers and missing the studio environment and, and those kind of things. I, I suspect that these are challenges that are, again, not unique to community colleges and are probably mostly familiar to all of you as well. So those are things that definitely were amplified by the COVID crisis. Um, you know, other challenges that community college students often face, um, you know, I think I have questions about. So um, originally my focus was really on the inequity of transfer student placement. 
um, and especially where students place in studio. Um, and so, you know, it's not uncommon for our students to enter the transfer process and place as a junior at one institution or into junior studio at one institution and then find themselves placed at another institution in a sophomore or freshman studio. Um, and, you know, sometimes, you know, they place into the junior studio at a private school that's quite expensive and other times they'll place into the freshman or sophomore studio at a public institution, which is more affordable. And so just thinking about if you were in that situation, how you would approach that. And I think one of the challenges really stems from the fact that um, studio culture at, at architecture schools is really central to the way that schools see themselves. But sometimes this can lead to um, the university program saying things to our students like, well, we teach studio differently. And so we want you to retake this class that you've already taken because um, we do it different here. And so our students hear that quite a bit. Um, and that's a particular challenge. And it's unique to architectural education because we're not hearing that a lot like for a calculus class or on another gen ed curriculum. Um, it tends to be almost always with studio placement. So that's a, that's a challenge. And I don't know how that changes um, with the COVID crisis, but maybe this is an opportunity to rethink, you know, the equity of how we grant transfer credit to community college students. Um, other challenges that the community college students face particularly post transfer are things like adjusting to a new university environment. So how do these student, students come in and adjust to a new studio culture, make new friends, you know, integrate into new cohorts. Um, a lot of times our students will tell us that they didn't know how to plot or they didn't know they needed training for a shop or, you know, things that just moving into a new institution, you know, just natural challenges of, of moving into a new institution. Um, sometimes feeling the feelings of otherness or feeling like an outsider. And so, I, you know, I think I'm wondering how does that all work in the fall if we're remote? Um, you know, how do these students, you know, transfer in and then feel as if they are a welcome part of the junior studio when they might be taking that class from a Zoom in their bedroom? So those are some, some things that I think are kind of questions. So I guess my kind of overarching questions for just to think about as we move into discussion is just how can, you know, it's related to community college students or how can we help community college students adjust to new campus environments, especially during a pandemic. Um, and then just sort of thinking about overarchingly like who's getting left behind, who are we not serving and how do we make sure that we don't kind of limit student access to an architectural education um, by creating unnecessary barriers. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to our moderators, and I think we're going to open it up to a more lively discussion. Mark, there was a comment just that Amy made about wondering with regards to um, how non-NAB accredited programs address studio culture. And so representing community colleges, if you, just wondering if you would mind sharing a little bit of your insights on that. Well, as non-NAB accredited programs, we're not held to the same standards. So we don't have to have studio culture policies, um, but we're always really, I think, watching what the university programs are doing and trying to make sure, I mean, our biggest concern is that our, student, our, our students seamlessly transfer, right? So we want our studios to look like the university studios. And I think we're you know, acutely aware of um, all of the studio culture challenges that go with that. And so I think we're kind of in the same, we're in tune with that, but we don't have to have published statements and we obviously don't have NAV accreditation um, that would govern that. Yeah, I know one of the things that had occurred to me and I realized that not, that of course there are non-NAV accredited programs that are ACSA members or associate members, um, you know, that 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 might be another um, you know another another sort of channel and looking at how some of the different collateral organizations um, you know I mean NAB is of course the the kind of most requirement you know the, the most focused on those kinds of requirements but certainly um, you know promoting the I think promoting those kinds of statements would be and, and developing them um, 
through the involvement of other organizations, um, you know, could be one way to, to think about dealing with that. Um, I think, uh, you know, we've, we've had some really great comments um, in the chat so far um, to kind of start with um, just some ideas about, uh, you know, what kinds of things have people noticed, especially and what have your experiences been in terms of issues of equity and studio learning culture, um, particularly since the start of the pandemic and the move to virtual, um, you know, teaching, and if those have been significantly different or if they're heightening or exacerbating conditions that were there previously. And I think that's very much something for both students and faculty, um, you know, to, uh, to consider or to, you know, and you can, in this case, I would say we could probably do hand raising, do you think? Yeah, use, that's yeah. what, thanks Nadia. I was gonna say, uh, as much as the education committee loves to hear themselves talk, uh, we would love to have <laughs> more voices in this conversation. So yeah. for those of you that would like to speak up um, in the participants button, uh, please hit the raise hand feature and we'll go ahead and, and let you talk. So just to reiterate the question, what are, what are some of the, the challenges um, or inequities that have come maybe to the forefront because of uh, the, the current or the, the immediate shift that we had to, to online learning? Okay, just just to get the, the conversation. Oh, no, okay, cool. We got some people. Um, so we'll go ahead and call on Jane first. Um, I'm with Mark uh, in the community college. So obviously our situation is different from many others. Um, but even those of you at four year and uh, professional programs, I think um, when our students are living at home um, in a non-residential environment, some of these transformations have not been as dramatic. Um, but what they have all lost um, is the support system of each other. And I think that has been a, uh, it, it has hurt the least prepared the most. Um, they would typically um, have a classmate that they used as a, uh, a guide through the class. You know, that when they didn't understand the lecture, when they didn't understand the language, the vocabulary, the terminology, the software, they had that buddy that they would turn to, to, to help them out. And though we might say, contact me, here's my cell phone, you know, I'm, I'm here for you. There, there isn't that peer uh, aspect that makes them comfortable asking us those questions um, or just walking by somebody else's desk and seeing how they did it and, you know, copying that, that pattern. Um, and so I think those at the, the lower level, uh, the least successful, the least prepared are being further harmed. Uh, Naomi, you, you had. Yeah. Sorry, I was muted. I, yeah, but you got the, you, you got the idea. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm actually in the landscape architecture program at University of Maryland. Um, but we went online too, as did architecture at UMD. And um, you know, a lot of, uh, well, I was, this year I was teaching sophomores, so it was their second studio of the program, and um, I did send out a survey, but, you know, problems with going online, um, different types of computers that people had, um, different ab abilities, um, 
some people had left a lot of their stuff in studio and weren't allowed back because we we people left for spring break and then so a lot of them didn't even have like scale rulers <laughs> or trace um and uh yeah so a, a host of issues um that the department will be addressing this summer because we'll likely be teaching online at least in the fall again um but uh, like jane just said i think that my students one of the things they missed the most was each other and just being able to walk by someone's desk and say oh what have you been working on and having everyone kind of at the same level in studio um where you know, no matter what their lives were going on outside of studio, they could all come in and be at their desks and do their work together, kind of on the same on the same page. Um, and lastly, I think um, to create, uh, it was important for them to see each other's work. And so, for every class during studio, when it was synchronous we would have um, a time when people would show their work or we would share a Google Doc. Um, so at least people weren't completely working in their, their own little bubble for the whole time until the, you know, the midterm review and the final review. And that they seemed to like and that was helpful. Sorry, I keep uh, forgetting to mute. Patty, I see you raising your hand. Did you want to? Uh, yeah, if you don't mind, I'm a student at UNCC, and um, it, what's being said here is exactly true. Um, um, being able to be in the studio and being able to see what other people are working on and how it's done, um, my reference points are different um, from students that have been in previous architectural programs. Uh, so being able to see how they do it where they're at, the direction they're going, um, is uh, just as much of an educational process as it is sitting with the instructor or listening to the professor. Um, I think it's really important to have group participation, even at the thought of sometimes maybe a student feeling un uncomfortable um, showing the project, um, maybe getting feedback from other students, um, sometimes having another student say, maybe you could do it this way, or maybe you could try it that way, um, presents a different perspective, that, um, which provides a well-rounded, encompassing response to your work, um, and then gives it more of an entirety of feedback. Um, so I believe that a lecture is great, talking, you know, seeing notes, the, that is important. But as far as um, being able to uh, show our projects, our work with everybody, um, I th think it gives a broader perspective and a more well-rounded studio uh, process. I think that's a great way to incorporate the studio um, at a distance. Just wanted to bring that up. But I, I think both of what you said, both of you were spot on. Thanks for saying that. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Let's see. Okay, I'm not muted. Thanks very much for that. Um, I'm wondering, looking at some of the things uh, in the chat. Okay, so I see we've got a raised hand from Nancy. Did you want to chime in on this? Nancy Clark. Hi, I'm from the University of Florida. One of the things that helped me a lot and some of the other faculty is we used a virtual wall. And so the students had access. It's, there's a lot of programs, but we used a program called Miro. And it's a virtual wall. They can pin up their work. Everyone who has um, the link can access it at any time, 24 seven. And they can uh, look at everyone else's work. So it's just like a wall in a studio. And it was it's so helpful because what I found was it's I mean, look, it's not as good as being in, in studio and hearing the murmuring or being a part of the murmuring, but they actually started contacting each other. How did you make that drawing? What were you thinking about? And 
you know, it was after studio hours that they were communicating with each other because they would go and look at someone else's board or part of the wall. So I found that extraordinarily helpful to in, to in some way try and simulate the studio environment and the, the sense of community and sharing of work. Yeah. Okay, Shannon, you've got your <laughs> your real hand raised. <laughs> How are you doing? Um, one Good to thing. See you. <laughs> you um, building on that, uh, I had my students uh, div divide in teams of three and four students. So every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we had a set time, and so they built a kind of um, sub core of group. Um, we also met uh, at the end of the studio to check in with the entire group, but they would all pre-record um, voiceover slideshows um, and oh. they were due the midnight before studio. Um, so they would talk about their work. They would show a series of slides and talk through the process because I found that the static image was open to a lot of interpretation. And if the other students heard the students talking about that work, they understood what they were thinking about then when we met, the students could look at that between midnight and the next day in class and be able to go through two or three other voiceovers. And by the time we met, we had a 30 or 40 minute um, conversation in response to that work. And the students were asked to make comment. We did that 18 times um, after spring break. By the end of the semester, they were all pretty good at um, presenting their work and talking through it, making sure that what we saw on the screen as a series of images was in line to a kind of thinking process. So um, I found that asynchronous way of working, letting the students who might be in different situations um, look at that work on their own time um, helpful, but also breaking down the groups and um, for the students to kind of practice um, over and over what they were thinking about developed, I think, a sort of empathy and support for the, the smaller group. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a great idea. Um, yeah, I am curious. Um, there was a post a little bit earlier, and I, I don't want to um, put anyone on the spot, but um, or I apologize ahead of time if I'm going to mispronounce your name. Um, Jati uh, mentioned, um, you know, talking about, I, I, I would talk, call it something about um, uh, accountability in terms of, um, you know, the perpetuation of certain kinds of academic structures and um, the the role that tenure plays in that. Could you, um, I, I'm, I'd, I'd be really curious to hear a little bit about your, a little bit more about these thoughts and um, what your, what your experiences or, you know, that kind of thing have been, and if you have suggestions. I'm glad you called on me. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm Jackie. <laughs> I'm Jati, and I just recently graduated with my Master's of Architecture from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and that's Nebraska-Lincoln, because um, <clears throat> I want to put my school up on there. Um, and I'm also one of the 2020 CRIT scholars that I recently just presented to Vice President Fogel and President um, Curry about new art, art, new art call. My thesis was New Art Call, Building Inclusion and Equity into Architecture Education. Um, so I did an entire thesis about why our schools are not building inclusion or how they are lacking in building inclusion and equity into architecture education. And I send this as a love letter, honestly, to my school, not as hate and a lot of, um, as we call it in our generation, shade. Uh, because I think a lot of times people think that brown folks, specifically younger brown folks in the millennial generation, are just noisy and that we just have no content but to make memes and all that. So when I say um, there are a lot of faculties out there who just perpetuate this condition of academic social stagnation, or I call it uh, kissing ass, uh, it's because y'all don't understand what it's like sometimes to be in a position that does not have any power. The AIS made that report on redesigning studio culture task force um, in 2002, and we're still talking about this in 2020. And it's debilitating to hear that no one in my school knew about that studio culture until it was brought up by students. 
Um, but more importantly, though, what you, you talked about accountability is what I was trying to, to hit on because empathy is great, but it only goes so far because in, in Nebraska, we have this thing called Nebraska nice is where I'm smiling and I'm saying, yeah, I feel you. I feel you. But it does not hold true if you're not accountable for it. So my position or rather my suggestion was that what if, I mean, obviously it's hypothetical because no one on this call has an overarching wand that can remove tenureship. But if half of these people on here, let alone everyone on this call, were to write a letter to their appropriate deans and or, or vice chancellors or chancellors of their school and say, we want to remove every single tenureship of every faculty in the College of Architecture and say, we will put that under review and have an equal vote between faculties and students. I wonder whether you all will have the same sort of tenureship composition as you do currently, because three fourths of you are white, three fourths of you are male. And I'm tired of seeing that because your experiences were not the same as what my experiences were. And your experiences are perpetuating the people who taught you because the people who taught you were all white. So I did a whole thesis. And just before I, before I end my, my little spiel on that, because like this is hard to say, um, I'm not just a brown kid who, who just happened to be, you know, it took a little longer in my undergraduate and stuff. Like my parents, my mom graduated from Cornell in the in 92. Um, and she was the Henry Adams Award medalist. And knew, no one knew who she was because she never used her real name until the very last day. And so she was the, the valedictorian at Cornell and the BARC. And so my mom has prestige and my dad has a doctorate degree in architecture education. So not in a, I'm not a prince of architecture but by any means, but I've had a lot of experiences growing up with two toxic people in my household. Um, and I'm just saying that y'all have some really real, real self-reflections to do if you want to talk about these discussions. Remove your tenureship just the way we should remove badges from from po police. And I'm tired of hearing about this stuff, man. It's like it's it's really frustrating. That's, That's just my input. All right. I would like to speak to that, and I would like to applaud you for speaking up because. I think students are really afraid to speak up. And again, being here in Mississippi in a state that has a high black population, but yet we have such a low number of black students and they're very afraid to speak up about racial issues. I, I'm very excited to hear you speaking up and talking about that. And I think that um, just how to be uh, an anti-racist racist by Abraham Kendi, if we start to think about that, it is definitely the responsibility of white people um, and it's the responsibility of males, people who are in power to uh, start approaching these things. And I would say though, empathy is not being nice. Empathy is putting yourself in the place of others and really trying to understand where they're coming from. And as a white woman, I can never completely understand where you're coming from, but I can make every effort possible to talk to you to try to understand and to help you as much as I can understand. And that is what I'm encouraging faculty to do in relation to empathy is to really make a hard and concerted effort because we will never move forward if people in power do not make that. And I appreciate you saying that. But that's also why I wanna encourage students. It's uncomfortable, I know. I wanna encourage students to have these conversations with their faculty, because until they speak up like you do, a lot of faculty are naive because they've never had those experiences. And so it's really important that you said that. And I really want to thank you for saying that. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. And, and I just want to say, like, I, I, I acknowledge my privilege. I'm privileged because, like, I've always had this position where, like, I talk back to my parents and my parents have always been sort of this metaphorical embodiment of architecture but um obviously i had to reconcile myself with some of that nevertheless it's a privileged position for me to critique something like this and other people who have never had experiences in architecture may find it hard to do that and so that's why i had to do it and i'm thinking i appreciate vice president fogel for always giving me a platform and President Curry for giving me a platform and thank you to the faculties who actually hear me and listen to, to some of the voices of students, specifically brown students and black students.
Yeah, and I see that Adam just shared a, a YouTube link to Jati's thesis presentation because I was going to ask that also if, if, if we could get your, um, I, because I would be very interested to, um, to, to look at that work. I think, um, you know, I, I think that one of the things that faculty struggle with is um, the need, and this is probably part of our culture that we've come out of, the need to not be uh, vulnerable, the need to seem strong and um, in control and, you know, knowing that we know what we're doing, otherwise you will not have confidence in us. And um, I can tell you as a woman who's received a lot of teaching evaluations um, that, you know, critiques of who has knowledge and who does not have knowledge tend to vary a lot based on, um, you know, gender, um, race, all sorts of, of issues. And I also say that I think it's critical for faculty to be willing to be vulnerable um, and admit to students that they don't know everything and you know and so that that can help because you know i don't know what the experiences are of you know of a young man of color growing up or who's you know 20 years younger than or more than i am um and i would like to know more um and it's sometimes difficult to figure out how to ask those questions i think so yes thank you um, I want to write, let's see, Rachel has, has a hand up for the question. Yeah, so I just first wanted to thank Jati for all of that. That was amazing to hear. Um, and also to everyone for these platforms that we are continuously given to talk about this stuff to not only students, but also professionals and other faculty members, whether they're at our school or not. Um, I have a lot to say about everything, but I guess um, the one thing that I was, um, that I raised my hand for was about the first year students engagement, um, because that's always a big thing, I feel like for every school every year. Um, but IIT, our College of Architecture, has started in the past few years giving us um, a slot in their welcome week programming to have a Q&A with them, um, not just about AIS or NOMAS or ASLA, but also just about being a student in college and also architecture. So if for some unfortunate reason we are still online in the fall, um, if your school doesn't do that already, I would strongly suggest trying to get a platform set up to do it virtually because even if they didn't have a few days to meet each other in person, I still think some um, kind of town hall or open platform for us to talk to them and maybe a few of them might be confident and vocal enough to interact with us. Um, but I think if they can see that upperclassmen are trying to put effort into engaging with them, they might feel a little more comfortable like that they belong at that school or that they have people that they can confide in during these uncertain times because all of the returning students have gone through online schooling for the past few months. So we do have some experience, even though we're not strictly online students. Um, or if we are in person again, that's great. And then hopefully people can engage with the first years or transfers is also a big thing because we also at IIT get a lot of College of DuPage students um, and we love them all. But um, I would just say, if you try to stick your foot out for them, maybe they, not say, they might not say vocally or not, but I'm sure that they would appreciate any effort to engage them with the other students that are in the same position as them. Jane, I can just weigh in a little bit too. Thank you for that, um, Rachel. With regards to the question, really appreciate it. And I, I direct a first semester kind of first day intensive class that is really about building community for students going, entering and moving into studio. And I have other colleagues from Boston Architectural College here to please weigh in too with your experiences. So a couple things that um, I have done and moving forward into the fall and planning on it, um, potentially exploring and incorporating specifically within building cohorts. So like say a, a smaller group of students who will be in a studio. So the first is that um, one of the things I do at the very, very beginning is I have kind of like a fun, I'm gonna say it's a survey, but it's, I call it um, constructing me. And it's it's more of a get, get to know you thing. I, 
I ask them to put like a profile pic and their name and where they're from and where they're kind of staying currently, you know, a, a motto, um, uh, something that inspires them like a poem or music. And then some, some reasons why they like design, what they're looking to kind of get out of the class. I will take that and build a little mosaic with everybody's uh, profile pic. And then I will distill it down to usually where people are from and their personal motto. But I think, and then we'll share it together in a session like this through Zoom. Um, but it's nice for everybody to sort of see each other. Uh, with that exercise, I create a playlist um, of things and of sources that inspire students that help them um, one of the things that I had done to re to modify that this semester was I asked students what they did to de-stress and to kind of free their mind and rejuvenate. Um, and then I also asked students about what their kind of personal studio space looked like, what their you know, their in-home studio space looked like, and um, how they felt that it could be improved through design. So these are just things that while you're at a distance, I found with I've done it now twice. Um, because for this particular class, it was actually already online, fully online before before um, COVID. And so it's really helped. Uh, students really like it. They really respond well. And they like to kind of see the, you can, it's a quick way of getting personalities to come, you know, come through. A motto is a fast way of getting some new personality. Um, and then just other quick tools that we use. WhatsApp, that, there was a comment about FERPA. So long as it's not, there's no personal record, there's no indication of grades or institutional record. We use WhatsApp for studios a lot. It's actually quite essential for us at, to, to allow students to talk to one another. Um, it's free, you, you can, it's a free internet-based phone call, messaging, um, video service, share pics. So WhatsApp is pretty essential, I think, for all of our, our studios, um, both online and now uh, all, online since we um, with COVID. We also had online studios prior to this. And then the last one I'm looking into is Marco Polo. It's also social media, um, but it's something I think I'm going to do in the fall. And it's uh, a way of where students can quickly do video um, video captures of, and respond to one another and kind of go back and see short videos um, and talk and explore and share work that they're doing. So those are some things that I'm using to help build community for those for primarily looking at like first semester kind of first really entry level students, masters and undergrad. And I'd like to add to that as well. Um, I know that we had a struggle with not just our first year students because they're in the residence halls and they don't have space except for studio to do their design projects and Beth's idea about having the students um, analyze their studio spaces and design how to make them work better I think is a great idea because how can we help our students who um, have to go live in a home with many other siblings and parents how do they carve out a space of their own and maybe that becomes a design challenge at the beginning of the semester in order to help them think about what their needs are and how can they claim space even if it's not within their home is it something in their yard is it something somewhere um you know and everybody's situation is different right again i'm in a rural area so we have more space than a place like boston um but it's a design challenge as with everything else and i think something else that might be helpful and i don't know how doable this is but is there any way to talk to upper administration and put freshmen architecture students together in the residence halls so that they could together in their residence hall rooms, their dorm rooms, come up with a design challenge to design and work together. Because when you have a non-architecture roommate, as we all have probably experienced, they have no idea, they don't understand it, and it's a challenge to get anything done. Um, so that may be something upper administration would be willing to work on since they have these, um, I guess, focused um, learning communities and residence halls now that might be helpful but i definitely think that is one of the biggest challenges in addition to internet connectivity our students just don't have a place to make models they don't have a place to design and that's really hard for them to concentrate whereas some of our students did better when they got away from the social hour that is studio so it's a mixed bag as to how it positively or negatively impacts our students based on their personal surroundings
I'd like to add one more thing. Uh, this is a cluster uh -huh. that uh, we are um, doing orientation online for our students, all the freshmen in the university in general. But also we have a summer program that used to be face to face and we're going to have seniors uh, uh, from high school who are going to start with us this summer and we're going to have a whole week of just orientations and games to play with and to know each other and to know the faculty members. So uh, we are working on trying to achieve uh, the same way that they know each other in the classroom and uh, as for the uh, housing on campus, uh, they do put uh, students from the same program to the best they can in the same uh, kind of uh, units so they can be able to have even a, a supervisor who's coming from the same program that can help them. Good. Okay, it looks like I think Amy, you had your, your hand up next. Hi, um, sorry, let me just get situated. So I wanted to touch on a few different topics that have been somewhat insinuated, but not necessarily highlighted to the degree that I think might be necessary. Um, the first was we've talked about communication in a way where we are emphasizing the need to over communicate, which is absolutely appropriate given our current distributed situation. However, I think when we incorporate mental health into the topic of communication, we must recognize that students, the awareness of mental health issues is put in a handicapped position, given that faculty do not have access to students, they might not actually be able to see that anything's wrong. The ability to have your video off, for instance, whether it be just for personal reasons or because you are simply unwell, you can't necessarily make that distinction or make that assumption. And I think there are a lot of assumptions being made that are dangerous and we need to be aware of that. Um, I think in addition, that kind of calls attention to a need to balance over communication and individualized communication and outreach. And I would honestly pose that it's on the faculty, perhaps, it's in it's a responsibility and perhaps an agency of faculty to perform that individualized outreach. And it does require additional time. And I think that might need to be incorporated into this current model if we do go forward um, in this fashion in the fall. Um, in addition though, I think ironically, students are also being put on a pedestal where we're, they're seeing that because we are technically in one place, at all times, um, that time is now being allocated to additional workloads. Um, so aside from communication, I think we just need to readdress work-life balance as a whole and understand that just because students are at home, um, it doesn't mean that they are able to take on a larger workload. Um, they're able to maybe emphasize their lives in different manners. Um, so I wanted to call attention also, I'm sorry, I have a number of points and I'm taking a lot of time, but um, here's a survey. This is not about students, so caveat. This is about um, working professionals, but it is talking about Gen Z and how the presumptions we've made about Gen Z individuals being great at this remote work um, situation are being counteracted by these assumptions and the overburdening of calls and work and they're struggling due to different expectations of communication and a lack of time to get work done. So I just gave a lot and thank you for giving me the floor. Yeah, no, thank you, Amy, for sharing that. I, I know that when we initially went online, um, one of the uh, kind of pieces of advice that, that was kind of going around the, the faculty at my school was, well, to keep, you know, how important it is to keep students on track so that they don't fall off the, the wagon, so to speak. And so everybody started giving lots of very specific assignments. And, you know, it was pretty apparent within about a week, uh, you know, a lot of my studios were like, whoa, hold on, like we've got this for this class and this for this class. And everybody was really, um, and it was overwhelming to, to sort of shift also as a faculty member to 
um, you know, at least at least for me, I didn't have all sorts of little every class this is due or that is due, you know, it were more broad general kinds of things. And I think that I was very thankful to my students for being kind of clear and, you know, just at one point I had a, I had a student who just said, you know what, I, I just can't get this done this week because I've got this and this and this and I, and this is where I started asking other people and it became clear that there was a lot of unintended overburdening going on because we had this idea that everybody, all the students were going to somehow drop off into the ether um, if they weren't being, you know, kind of <laughs> pounded. And I think that that shifted. Um, but I see Stephen, you have your hand up. I saw Donna actually, she had her uh, physical hand up if she wants oh, to go okay. ahead. Oh, sorry. You're muted, Donna. Oh, just one comment briefly. Um, and I found this out from, because we all teach different students and they report on different things and we're all really learning with this, but uh, the upper year and fifth year students, um, I would try to bring them in from time to time for brief meetings or to say something that I recall what they had done, that they could share this. And if we're online in the fall, I'm starting to think this is going to be very important that they connect up with upper year students. In our school, our students are all organized, if I could say together, so all the different classes are together, but uh, for that, just that purpose. But the thing I found out that was rather nice, and it might be a great challenge to the students, the upper year students, the fifth year, thesis students were obviously very unhappy that the last six weeks was gone to them and the colleagues and so forth. Although there were incredible things we did actually. Um, and in time they may think differently about it. But anyway, they scheduled time with themselves when they could simply be modeling together. And I thought that that was really wonderful. Uh, so the challenge might be is how do you get this laptop <laughs> to rotate so it can look down on your hands as you're modeling. So four or five of them would be modeling together and they would just have Zoom open and just being there watching each other's things. It was really wonderful to hear that. So that's my comment. On, on that, and there have been some comments. There was a comment um, from Naomi about creating kind of packages to send. And I definitely heard that in many um, other conversations about what folks are doing, um, pulling together supplies, potentially books, sketchbooks. Uh, so with that, one thing that I think we're thinking about, at least certainly I'm, I'm thinking about is including uh, little scrappy but very effective boom to allow students to situate their phone in a way so that they can record and share the work that they're doing on the work surface. Um, and so that is partly what I'm trying. I think that we should absolutely build into the conversation about how to set up your, your studio um, so that now that's what you can kind of see instead of the whole person you're seeing what they're working on. Very good. Okay. Um, I think Aaron, Aaron Conti, you were. Stephen, Stephen had his hand raised first. Oh, sorry. Stephen, did you have another comment or? I, I do have one quick oh, comment. Oh, sorry. That's all right. Don't worry about it. Um, I, I just wanted to, to touch on um, something that Adam brought up at the very beginning, which was the uh, studio culture, um, uh, what's the word? Um, the, the document that basically outlines what is supposed to be done and what should not be done. And I think, you know, that's important, um, but, but practicing what you preach is more important by the professors. And uh, one of the most important things that has happened in my experience, I'm currently a master's student at UNC Charlotte, but 
when I was an undergrad at UVA, um, the dean at the time, Beth Meyer, uh, invited the whole um, student body. It, it was a big group, not the whole student body, and a few faculty um, to sit and, and share their own opinions about what their experience was like as students um, and as teachers. And it was a very open conversation. And, and Beth Meyer, I admire how she uh, opened how hard it was for her career and, and for her student uh, studies and everything else. And for the students to see that and see what she had gone through and then to see how she was willing to say, I don't think it's worth having all nighters or I don't think it's worth to do that. Um, and to have that come straight from the Dean was, was really impactful. So I, I just wanted to um, take this opportunity to say that, that words and actions go a very, very long way in, in building respect and, and inspiring students to, to work healthily and collaborate in very um, good ways. And uh, so that, it may be hard, it may be easy. It, it's a very personal thing to do, but I mean, it worked quite well um, for Beth Meyer at UVA. Thank you. Thanks. And um, Alexis had a comment about this, is this issue with regards to synchronous and asynchronous mm -hmm. class time. And um, at the BAC, so we do it a number of different ways. And I think the question was about whether synchronous class helps students manage their time and feel less overwhelmed because it uh, is more similar to a regular schedule on site. So synchronous time is absolutely uh, important with something like midterms and finals and, and even pin up. I think that the time is spent, oh, there's a lot more one-on-one -on -one conversation. And so if, a, if the faculty is having a one-on-one -on -one conversation like a desk crit, then you, you know students don't necessarily need to be present for for all of that so in in some cases it might be asynchronous except for when you have an appointment with your faculty which might not actually fall within what would be normal class time it's something that you could schedule using um, calendly or something you know within the whole week one-on-one -on -one with your faculty which i think is affords a lot more flexibility for students um, than having, than having to always have a large portion of the day and several days dedicated to studio time. Um, I have asked my students about whether or not they want synchronous or asynchronous time. And I, I'm really trying to kind of embrace this co-creation of class <laughs> and um, kind of let go of control. And so my students had said, this is very in line with what Amy was sharing, but that they really only wanted synchronous time when it was like really important that, that, that they get that. So what I had done otherwise is basically record what I wanted to go over. And I tried to keep it short, but it was generally 30 to 45 minutes and then make that available for everybody to watch. If you put it on Moodle or Canvas, you can see who, you can make sure everybody's viewing it how many times they've watched it. Um, so you can make sure that they're engaged, but it is asynchronous. And then I, uh, I think I, you know, I've definitely limited the number of times that we were all together. So asking students what their preferences are um, and then trying to hold them accountable to the time that they're agreeing, I think people really appreciate it. And you might be surprised, you know, if students say we really want it to be synchronous, then you know, okay, you're not gonna burn out during this time because this is what you asked for. Um, and I, and I think it's a mix of, of both. Just looking at, at time here, uh, we have time for one more comment and I see Erin's hand is raised. So, so we'll go ahead and call on her and then the committee can go ahead and close out with, with some final thoughts. So Erin. Yeah, um, I'm Erin. I just graduated with my master's from IIT. Um, not to go too far in reverse, but I did want to touch a little bit on some of Amy's comments, particularly about mental health, just because I think it's really important um, and wanted to share kind of a personal story because it just made a really big difference for me as a student during this time. Um, like many students and faculty, like I struggled a lot mentally when everything kind of shut down and found myself falling behind. and. Even though I was just at home, I was still uh, working an internship from home and um, serving as Midwest Quad Director for the AIS and being a full-time student, and it got very overwhelming. And um, I was very nervous to talk to any of my professors about it. Um, 
like I think a lot of students are. Sometimes it's unfortunate, but it's still almost seen as, you know, you're using an excuse um, when we know mental health issues are very real and should be recognized. But um, I finally did one day, I just really needed a break and had not completed my assignments. And I was honest with my professors and said, here's the situation and I, I will not be attending class. I just need a breather um, and to catch up. Um, and a couple of my professors just said, okay. Um, but one of them reached out and said, hi, I totally understand. Um, would you like to have a call just to talk? Um, and I said, yes. And that weekend we talked on Zoom for about an hour, not even about the assignment at all, but just about how I was feeling and also how she was feeling about the whole situation. Um, and it really made a huge difference. It just took a lot of pressure off that I was feeling because I was just sitting thinking, um, she was going to be so disappointed I hadn't completed the assignment, but just talking uh, person to person, um, it made a really huge difference and helped me get through the rest of the semester. So I think keeping that in mind, both students and faculty, just being really upfront about how important taking care of your mental health is along with getting through all of our courses. Um, yeah, thank you. Erin, I really appreciate that as well, because that's what I was hoping to convey with this idea of empathy. And Nadia talked about everybody being able to um, kind of let their guard down and show that we're human. And I think you making that point from a student perspective is really great because as faculty, sometimes we feel like we always have to be strong for our students. And being able to talk about how we are scared and we are frustrated and we're exhausted as well definitely humanizes us and we can start to be more empathetic because we start to think, hey, maybe my students are having the same concerns with money and with childcare and things like that. So I appreciate you saying that and the fact that you were brave enough to talk to your faculty about that, even though you were scared. Yeah, I think that's really important. And I, I know, um, you know, we're just about at time. I think though that one of the things I worry about, I, and I know I, I, I saw a comment, um, you know, about a, a not very non-sympathetic faculty member who basically said, you know, suck it up and, and you know, get through it, um, that the ability for students and, you know, for students, if they, to be able to go to a different faculty member, I think, you know, sometimes the, uh, you know, having, having office hours can be as productive because somebody can drop in and, you know, and, and I think that that's one of the things that not being sort of present, you know, in the physical space. I mean, yes, you can schedule an appointment and a time, but I think that can be, um, it, it's much, it feels much more formal. And so that's, you know, one of the things that I wondered about is, you know, is there a way to create, you know, like an open office hour or something where, you know, not only can my students drop in, but if there's another student that maybe a former student that, that you know, has a concern about something um, that, you know, we can do that without having to, the formality of having to always schedule a Zoom appointment was something that um, I found a little bit uh, overwhelming <laughs> and I, you know, and I know that, that um, others mentioned that too, that the ability of how to interact with the community of the studio in a casual way, um, you know, really gets kind of, um, uh, you know, truncated by the, the, um, the formality of the online community. So, um, I think that that's, that that's something that we need to be cognizant of. Um, and I'll yeah. say I miss also miss my, my colleagues who I often, you know, drop in on casually to sometimes for a sort of mental health break, you know, and not that maybe, maybe people that I don't have long standing relationships with, but we can have a chat, you know, of some kind. And so um, I think those are challenges to think about. Um, you know, into the future. So, well, we are now at time, it looks like. Yeah, thank you everyone for, for jumping on. Um, this was a great discussion and just a, a quick thing. We've seen uh, Naomi just shared a Facebook group. 
Um, I just created this Google Doc. If you would just want to throw your name and email on it, I know a lot of people um, are still having conversations in chat, which is great. Um, and so just because the call is over, we don't want the conversations to stop. So please join that group. Uh, put your name, school email on the Google Doc. And that way you can continue talking about equity and empathy. You can continue talking about tools that you'll need for your students and how to engage with new and first year transfer students um, during an online environment, et cetera, et cetera. Um, thank you everyone who, who spent the last hour and a half with us today. The ACSA Education Committee is very excited on how this all turned out. We're glad that we were able to put all of our hard work <laughs> into a formal presentation of some kind, um, even with the annual meeting not, not being held in person this year. Um, and we're also really glad that we got to include students in this conversation, especially because mm -hmm. it does affect both sides. And yeah, we wouldn't have teachers if we didn't have students. Um, so with that, thank you everyone and enjoy the rest of your evening. All right. Thank, thank you. Everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody. Yes. And thank you to the committee as well. <laughs>